Chapter 3 of At the Time Appointed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Joe Wright. At the Time Appointed by A. Maynard Barbour Chapter 3 The Pines as the day advanced, Darrow grew gradually but steadily worse. After the excitement of the night had passed, a reaction set in. He was utterly exhausted and miserable. The pain returned with redoubled violence, and the fever increased perceptibly from hour to hour. He was keenly observant of those about him, and he could not but note how soon the tragedy of the preceding night seemed forgotten. Some bemoaned the loss of money or valuables, a few more fortunate related how they had outwitted the robbers and escaped with trivial loss. But only an occasional careless word of pity was heard for the young stranger who had met so sad a fate. So quickly and completely does one human atom sink out of sight. It is like the dropping of a pebble in the sea, a momentary ripple, that is all. About noon, Parkinson who had sought to while away the tedium of the journey by an interview with Darrell, became somewhat alarmed at the latter's condition and went in search of a physician. He returned with the one who had been summoned to Whitcomb's aid. He was an Eastern practitioner, and unfortunately, for Darrell, was not so familiar with the peculiar symptoms in his case as a Western physician would have been. He has a high fever, he remarked to Parkinson a little later, as he seated himself beside Darrell to watch the effect of the remedies administered but I do not apprehend any danger. I've given him something to abate the fever and induce sleep. If necessary, I will write out a prescription, which he can have filled on his arrival at Ophir, but I think in a few days he will be all right. They were now approaching the Continental Divide, the scenery moment by moment growing in the sublimity and grandeur. Darrell soon sank into sleep, light and broken at first, which grew deeper and heavier. For more than an hour he slept, unconscious that the rugged scenes through which he was then passing were to become part of his future life, that each cliff and crag and mountain peak was to be to him an open book, whose secrets would leave their indelible impress upon his heart and brain, revealing to him the breadth and length, the depth and height of life, molding his soul anew into nobler, more symmetrical proportions. At last the rocks suddenly parted, like sentinels, making way for the approaching train, disclosing a broad sunlit plateau, from which rose in gracefully rounded contours a pine-covered mountain, about whose base nestled the city of Ophir, while in the background stretched the majestic range of the Great Divide. A crowd could be seen congregated by the depot, for tidings of the night's tragedy had preceded the train by several hours, and Whitcomb from his early boyhood, had been a universal favorite in Ophir, while his uncle was one of the wealthiest, most influential citizens. As the train slackened speed, Parkinson, with a few words to the physician, hastily left to make arrangements for transportation for himself, Hunter, and Darrell to the hotel. Amid the noise and confusion which ensued for the next ten minutes, Darrell slept heavily, till, aroused by a gentle shake, he awoke to find the physician bending over him, and heard voices approaching, down, the now nearly deserted sleeping car. Yes, said a voice, speaking rapidly. The conductor wild details. He said this young man did everything for the boy that could be done, stayed by him to the end. He did, stood by him like a brother, Parkinson's voice replied. The other man spoke once more. And he is sick, you say? Well, he won't want for anything that's in my power to give him. Parkinson stopped at Darrell's side. Mr. Darrell, he said. This is Mr. Underwood, Whitcomb's uncle. You know, Mr. Underwood, Mr. Darrell. Darrell rose a little unsteadily. The two men grasped his hands, and for an instant neither spoke. Darrell saw before him a tall, powerfully built man, approaching fifty, whose somewhat bronzed face was shrewd, stern, and unreadable, and was lighted by a pair of blue eyes which had once resembled Whitcomb's. With a swift, penetrating glance, the elder man looked searchingly into the face of the younger. True as steel, 
with a heart of gold, was his mental comment. Then he spoke abruptly. Mr. Darrell, my carriage is waiting for you outside. You'll go home with me, unless, he added inquiringly, you are expecting to meet friends or acquaintances. No, Mr. Underwood, Darrell replied. I'm a stranger here. Much as I appreciate your kindness, I could not think of intruding upon your home at such a time as this. Porter, said Mr. Underwood, with the air of one accustomed to command, take this gentleman's luggage outside and tell them out there that it is to go to the Pines. My men are there, and they will look after it. Then turning to Daryl, he continued, still more brusquely. This train pulls out in three minutes, so you'd better prepare to follow your luggage. You'll stop in Ophir outside my house, and I don't think you'll travel much farther for a while. You look as though you needed a bed and good nursing more than anything just now. I have given him a prescription, sir, said the physician, that I think will set him right if he gets needed rest and sleep. Hmm, responded Mr. Underwood gruffly. He'll get whatever he needs. You can depend on that. You gentlemen assist him out of the car. I'll go and dispatch a messenger to the house to have everything in readiness for him there. At the foot of the car steps, Daryl parted from the physician, and leaning on Parkinson's arm, slowly made his way through the crowd to the carriage where Mr. Underwood awaited him. Mr. Underwood then helped the young man into the carriage. A spasm of pain crossed Daryl's face as he saw, just ahead of them, waiting to precede them on the homeward journey, a light wagon containing a stretcher, covered with a heavy black cloth, with a line of stalwart fellows drawn up on either side, and he recalled Whitcomb's parting words on the previous night. When we reach Ophir tomorrow, you'll go directly home with me. This was observed by Mr. Underwood, who remarked a moment later as he seated himself beside Darrell, and they started homeward. This is a sad time to introduce you to our home and household, Mr. Darrell, but you will find your welcome nonetheless genuine on that account. Mr. Underwood, said the young man in a troubled voice, this seems to me the most unwarrantable intrusion on my part to accept your hospitality at such a time. Before he could say more, Mr. Underwood placed a firm, heavy hand on his knee. You stood by my poor boy, Harry, to the last, and that is enough to ensure you a welcome from me and mine. I'm only doing what Harry himself would do if he were here. As to what I did for your nephew, God knows, it was little enough I could do, Darrell answered bitterly. I was powerless to defend him against the fatal blow. And after that, there was no help for him. Did you see him killed? Yes. Tell me all, everything, as it occurred. Mr. Underwood little knew the effect this caused Daryl in his condition, to go over the details of the terrible scene. But Daryl forced himself to give a clear, distinct, calm statement of all that took place. The elder man sat looking straight before him, immovable, impassive, like one who heard not, yet in reality, and see nothing that was said. Not until Darrow repeated Whitcomb's dying words was there any movement on his part. Then he turned his head so that his face was hidden and remained motionless and silent as before. At last he inquired, Did he leave no message for me? He mentioned only your daughter, Mr. Underwood. He evidently had some message for her, but she was unable to give. A long silence followed. Daryl, utterly exhausted, sank back into a corner of the carriage. The movement aroused Mr. Underwood. He looked towards Daryl, whose eyes were closed, and was shocked at his deathly pallor. He said nothing, however, for Daryl was again sinking into a heavy stupor, but watched him with growing concern, making no attempt to rouse him until the carriage left the street and began ascending a long gravel driveway. Then putting his hand on Daryl's shoulder, he said, quite loudly, Wake up, boy. We're getting home now. To Daryl, his voice sounded faint and far away, like an echo out of a vast distance. And it was some seconds before he could realize where he was or form any definite idea of his surroundings. Gradually, he became conscious that the air was no longer hot and stifling, but cool and fragrant, with a sweet, resinous breath of the pines. Looking about him, he saw that they were winding up a long avenue, 
cut through a forest of small, slender pines, which extended below them on one side and far above them on the other. A moment later, they came out into a clearing, whence he could see, rising directly before him, a series of natural terraces. Upon one of the terraces of the mountain stood a massive house of unhewn granite, a house representing no particular style of architecture, but whose deep bay windows, broad winding verandas, and shadowy secluded balconies all combined to present an aspect most inviting. To Darrell, the place had an irresistible charm. He gazed at it, as though fascinated, unable to take his eyes from the scene. You certainly have a beautiful home, Mr. Underwood, he said, and a most unique location. I never saw anything quite like it. It'll do, he said quietly, gratified by the look on his companion's face. I built it for my little girl. It was her own idea to have it that way, and she has named it the Pines. Thank God I've got her left yet, though that's all I've got. Something in his tone caused Daryl to glance quickly towards him with a look of sympathetic inquiry. They were now approaching the house, and Mr. Underwood turned, facing him, a smile for the first time lighting up his stern, rugged features, as he said, You will find us what my little girl calls us, a patched-up family. I am a widower. My widowed sister keeps the house for me, and Harry, whom I had grown up to consider almost a son, was an orphan. But the family, such as it is, will make you welcome and I can speak for that. Here we are. With a supreme effort, Daryl summoned all his energies as Mr. Underwood assisted him from the carriage and into the house, but the ringing and pounding in his head increased. His brain seemed reeling, and he was so nearly blinded by the pain that notwithstanding his efforts, he was forced to admit to himself, as a little later he sank upon a couch in the room assigned to him that his impressions of the ladies to whom he had just been presented to were exceedingly vague. Mr. Underwood's sister, Mrs. Dean, he remembered as a large woman, low-voiced, somewhat resembling her brother in manner, and like him, a few words. Yet something in her greeting had assured him of a welcome, as deep as it was undemonstrative. Of Kate Underwood, in whom he had felt more of a passing interest, Remembering Whitcomb's love for his cousin, he recalled a tall, slender, girlish form, a wealth of golden brown hair and a pair of large, luminous brown eyes, whose wistful, almost appealing look haunted him strangely, though he was unable to recall another feature of her face. Mr. Underwood, who left the room to telephone for a physician, returned with a faithful servant and insisted upon Darrell's retiring to bed without delay a proposition which the latter was only too glad to follow. Darrell had already given Mr. Underwood the package of $15,000 found on the train, and now, while disrobing, handed him the belt in which he carried his own money, saying, I'll put this in your keeping for a few days, you know, until I feel more like myself. On the train, I did lose some watch and some change, but I took the liberty of having this hidden. He stopped abruptly, and seemed to be trying to recall something, then continued slowly. There was something else in connection with that affair, which I wish to say to you, but my head is so confused, I cannot think of what it was. Don't try to think of it now. It'll come to you by and by, Mr. Hunterwood replied. You're in good hands, so don't worry yourself about anything, but get through all the rest you can. With a deep sigh of relief, Daryl sank on the pillows, and was soon sleeping heavily. A few moments later, Mr. Underwood, coming from Darrell's room, having left the servant in charge, met his sister coming down the long hall. She beckoned, and, turning slowly, retraced her steps, her brother following, to another part of the house, where they entered a darkened chamber, and together stood beside a low, narrow couch strewn with fragrant flowers. Together, without a word or tear, they gazed on the peaceful face of this sleeper, wrapped in the breathless, dreamless slumber we call death. They recalled the years since he had come to them. The dying bequest of the younger sister, a little golden-haired prattler, to fill the home with the music of his childish voice and the sunshine of his smile. 
Already the great house seemed strangely silent, without his ringing laughter and his bursts of merry song. But of whatever bitter grief stirred within their hearts, this silent brother and sister, so long accustomed to self-restraint and self-repression, gave no sign. Gently, she replaced the covering over the face of the sleeper, and silently they left the room. Not until they again reached the door of Daryl's room was the silence broken. Then the brother said, in low tones, Marcia, we've done all for the dead that can be done. It's the living who needs our care now. Yes, she replied quietly. I was going to see what I could do for him when you had put him to bed. Bennett is in there now, and I'm going downstairs to wait for Dr. Bradley. He telephoned that he'd be up in twenty minutes. Very well. I'll sit by him till the doctor comes. When Dr. Bradley arrived, he found Daryl in a state of coma, from which it was almost impossible to arouse him. From Mr. Underwood and his sister, he learned whatever details they could furnish, but from the patient himself, very little information could be obtained. He has this fever that is prevailing in the mountainous districts, and he has it in its worst form, he said when about to take leave. Of course, having just come from the east, it would be worse for him in any event than if he were acclimated. But aside from that, the cerebral symptoms are greatly aggravated owing to the nervous shock which he received last night. To witness an occurrence of that sort would be more or less of a shock to nerves in a normal state, but in the condition he was at the time, it is likely to produce some serious complications. Follow these directions, which I have written out, and I'll be in again in a couple of hours. But in two hours, Daryl was delirious. Has he recognized anyone since I was here? Dr. Bradley inquired, as he again stood beside the patient. I don't think so, Miss Dean replied. I could hardly rouse him enough to give him the medicine, and even then he didn't seem to know me. I'll be in about midnight, said the physician, as he again took leave, and I'll send a professional nurse. This is likely to be a long siege. Send whatever is needed, said Mr. Underwood brusquely. And Mrs. Dean, the physician continued, if he should have a lucid interval, you had better ascertain the address of his friends. It was nearly midnight. For hours, Daryl had battled against the darkening shadows fast setting down upon him enveloping him with a horror worse than death itself. Suddenly, there was a rift of clouds, and the calm, sweet light of reason stole softly through. He felt a cool hand upon his forehead, and opening his eyes, looked with a smile into the face of Mrs. Dean as she bent over him. Bending still lower, she said, in low, distinct tones, Can you tell me the name of your people and where they live? In an instant he comprehended all that her question implied. He must give his own name and the address of the faraway eastern home. He strove to recall it, but the effort was too great. Before he could speak, the clouds surged together, and all was blotted out into the darkness. This is the end of Chapter 3.